Okay, everybody, we're ready to get started um, on the next part of our program. We've been talking all day about these in-between states, being here and not being here. Uh, and now we have Paul Preciado, who is both here and not here. Um, so he's, we can see he's very photogenic, so that's lucky. Uh, you can see him over here on our TV screen. So let me just say, give a very brief introduction. Um, what to say about Paul Preciado. Uh, he is an international man of mystery, uh, the author of a cult classic, Testo Junkie, Sex, Drugs, and the Biopol Biopolitics in the Pharmaco-Pornographic Era. He was the curator for the public events program for Documenta 14, where he created a parliament of bodies that was controversial and amazing. He holds a PhD in architecture from Princeton and published a treatise on modern masculinity that took the Playboy Mansion as its point of departure that is widely read in architectural circles. But it's Testo Junkie in many ways that continues to be his signature and his calling card um, into the world of politics, philosophy, and art. Part memoir, part theory of power in the age of Big Pharma, part rogue deconstruction, part utopian vision, Testo Junkie offers the most significant theory of the body and power since the publication of Gender Trouble by Judith Butler in 1989. Its contributions to literature and theory are manifold. Preciado is a rock star, a public intellectual, a public intellectual in at least three languages and as many disciplines. Preciado is a generous organizer, a capacious and brilliant thinker, and a figure for some of the most compelling and imaginative new ideas of our time. He's going to ex talk to us today about Every Life Matters, the work of Lorenza Butner, and you'll be able to see Lorenza's images up here. Please welcome Paul Preciado. Well, can, can you hear me well? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, it is really almost embarrassing to speak after this uh, hyper generous presentation that uh, Jack did. If Jack were not my uh, professor, mentor, everyone that uh, has done everything for my generation and the people like me to be able to do the kind of work that we do. So, I mean, everything that you said about me, I think I can just like multiply and say even more about, about you, Jack, and thank you so much for this uh, introduction and for welcoming, welcoming me in this forum, even though I'm not physically there. I'm, I'm really sorry there is like a big strike in France and of course, like everyone is complaining, like, well, this, 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 this strike, we should find other ways to do things. But maybe it's an interesting thing to go on a strike. I think that we need to go on a strike. And um, we need to go on a strike on institutions. We need to go on a strike on the streets. We, we need to stop working the way we do it. Because the, uh, the way we produce um, is at the is exactly the opposite that we are pretending that we're doing uh and this was one of my main contradictions when working uh, in documenta is that every idea that was i was trying to develop with the public program and the parliament of bodies in reality was undone by the very ways in which we do it which is like hyper production and not being able to stop to think about the things that we have to do so in a sense i am extremely sorry not to be there with you and at the same time i'm super happy uh to strike here and to f so i I ask you to feel this distance and this disconnection as my own way of striking with um, the uh, transportation, all the transportation workers here in, in France. Um, well, now that I have you there, uh, even though I'm not with you, I really would like to talk to you even briefly because I'm uh, on a Skype and I know that it's more difficult to follow, but i like to talk to you about the work of, of someone that I think, um, I mean, that you probably don't know and have not seen is someone that I've, I've shown as a curator myself. I've shown at Documenta 14 uh, just a few um, examples of her work, but I think is someone that deserves uh, much more attention than that. And 
we will eventually um, do an exhibition or maybe a series of exhibitions that will start um, next October in Barcelona in an institution that is called La Virreina and that will continue at the Kunstwerk de Stuttgart in 2019 because I think it's this work uh, really deserves to be seen. I was completely unknown and I mean to tell you the truth this work could have been totally lost. The reasons why we found this work are like really uh, astonishing. I mean I was working uh, a few years ago with a group of students uh, in Barcelona at the Independent Studies Program. And one of my students, Pera Pedrals, uh, started to work with me on transgender and disabled, let's say, creep artists. Uh, and the way in which were visible or invisible within uh, European art during the 80s, but especially in Spain, because you know that the 80s in Spain was precisely the moment after the dictatorship. And many uh, new political subjects be became visible at that time. So it was uh, there was a, a very important artist that, of course, is still again almost unknown, whose name is Okanya, that uh, was crucial for the development of the anti-fascist uh, movement and transgender movement in Spain. When researching Okanya. Then we decided to span this research and look for other transgender and also creep figures. You will understand why creep, why the issue of uh, resisting body normativity. And suddenly we found that in 1992, when the Olympics took place in Barcelona, an artist that called herself Lorenza was the mascot, the embodiment of the Paralympics. And the images that appeared at that time were so unbelievable that I decided to pursue, to continue this research with uh, Pera Pedras. And I started to look for these artists. Well, we found out that unfortunately, she had died in 1995. And um, basically, so we couldn't find her, even though she was, she could have been very young at this point, but we couldn't find her. So, but we started like a research project trying to find her. And one of the things that we found is that this unbelievable artist had been a student in Kassel. And as you know, Kassel is the site, the location of Documenta, the biggest European exhibition from the 50s. So that was like basically something that came to me as uh, destiny. You know, I went to Castle and for me, uh, even more important than Documenta itself was the task of finding Lorenza, trying to find who is this artist that was completely, was basically meant to be lost and invisible within history. And this is the way we, we found what we know now from his, her work. And um, for me, the question is, what is the body that the feminist and the LGBT movement, the queer movement, is placing as subject of a political transformation at the center of the scene? And I have to say that we've been placing mostly the same subject, the same political body and the same subject for years and years. And of course, this body is not a lesbian body. It is not a transgender body. And it's not a creep. It's not a, a functionally dissident or bodily dissident body. And, and I think that this is something that, this is a, a lesson that we can learn from Lorenza, both from the uh, difficulties that we had to find her work why these difficulties? Why was Lorenza so unknown? We don't have today much time, and also I'm on Skype, but uh, one of the amazing and interesting things is that Lorenza traveled enormously during her life and performed in many, many public places, including in New York, in many different places. So her work 
could have been documented and known. Nevertheless, this work was completely erased, was not known. Well, let me tell you a little bit of the story of Lorenza. You will see it in a different way within a film that I, I will show right after my, my talk. Lorenza um, was born in 1959, and he was born in Chile from a German family who was working, that was working in Chile at that time. Of course, Lorenza was assigned male gender when, when she was born. Together with that, when she was eight, she had an accident. She was a child, she was climbing to a pylon, and she received an electric shock. And because of this electric shock, both of her arms were fully burned and were amputated up to the, the shoulder. And what is interesting is exactly what is gonna happen after. Of course, first, what is gonna happen is that Lorenza, that at that time is treated as a male child, is being, is brought back to Europe, to the place where, of course, like uh, medical technologies can offer this body and this family a possible reconstruction. But of course, what kind of reconstruction? The reconstruction within normality, okay? So basically she will come with her mother in the, the 70s and she will be the object of an enormous amount of techniques of reparation of her body, both within the medical institution, but also she will be secluded, really, like a basically treated as a fully disabled child and secluded in an institution up to the point that she's 18. Of course, Lorenza at that time, who is treated as a, as a male child, as a disabled child, um, cannot even think about the possibility of becoming an artist. And this is my, my second question here, which I think is equally important than the, the, the issue of the, what is the political body that we are placing at the, scene, at the scene of transformation of queer, feminist, and trans politics. The second one is, can we even think of a body without arms as, on one side, a political subject, and on the other side, an artist? let alone the issue of being human, right? Because the, uh, what is gonna happen with Lorenza is that she will be treated as disabled, which means really, in a sense, uh, not enabling her to get access to full humanity. Uh, at the same time, of course, within the medical institution, they are forcing Lorenza to take a path which is not the path of art because she has no arms, she has no hand. And I think what is interesting here um, is the way in which the hand has been uh, placed at the, this hegemonic narrative, not only of humanization, this is something that has been studied really well by uh, Donna Haraway and, and other uh, historians of, uh, of science, so it's not just the story of humanization from the animal body to the human body, but also the hand is crucial within the, the narrative of masculinity, the narrative of political action. So how to act politically is like acting with your hands, right? L doing something. The, this narrative of uh, militancy, the narrative of political action as something that has to be done fully with your hands, right, within the world. And of course, the whole history of art production has been completely and fully devoted to the hand. Is the hand and the eye that are really like, it's basically we have, a, this is interesting for all of us to think about, what is the body that we are as artists and political activists. Okay, we are mostly a hand and an eye. And that's, that's what, in, in this constellation of relationships, is this is the epistemology in which political action and art are both possible and, in the case of Lorenza, impossible. So, uh, in the case of Lorenza, what is it's gonna be uh, extremely interesting is that 
she's going to develop something that we could call this the thinking feed is with her feed that she's going to be acting and thinking and performing and painting also with her mouth which both both the the mouth and the feet introduce really a rupture within the history of art uh, in, a, in a very simple way in terms of uh, the distance that the the artist has in relation to her work so sometimes lorenza as you will see within the the clips that i'm showing uh lorenza always starts by using her mouth to paint her her paintings and at the same time using her feet to paint her face. So this is this uh, loop of making up, make really like transforming her face into a female face through makeup with her feet and using her mouth for painting. But of course, what is interesting as well is that is that through this um, undoing of the hand, through the feet and through the mouth, she's also going to challenge the distinction of disciplines that we know in art. Because in a sense, she's going to start performing when painting and dancing at the same time. So in the work of Lorenza, it's very difficult to say if she's dancing or painting. She's really dancing with her feet and using her feet for painting at the same time and making the act of painting public. And of course, this is not just, uh, we could think that this is being inscribed in a tradition of freak uh, art in the sense of basically the way in which non-able artists have been forced to basically paint with the mouth or with the feet publicly to ask for money for this painting, basically transforming uh, the act of painting itself with the feet or mouth into a spectacle. And this Lorenza is doing something similar. At the same time, she's radically challenging the way in which public space is defined by the able body. So she's fully confronting uh, the, the people that are watching her performances with the the act of reclaiming her body, not, not as the object of a freak gaze, but rather as a political subject. This is something that you will see immediately in, the, in, the, um, bo in both clips that I, that I, will, uh, that I will show. Uh, and I, I will be brief, but I would just like to, to give you um, a few elements, basically to follow what will you, you will see. Of course, we've been talking a lot about, and especially some of us, because of our political position, about uh, the transgender body and the way in which the, the transgender or transsexual body becomes visible or invisible within different regimes of visibility. Um, I think it's interesting. Of course, the work of Lorenza forces us to do that, but not just the work of Lorenza. I think some of us, and I think this is my case as well, I think we do identify as transgender within a tradition of creep bodies, of bodies that have been treated and thought as disabled, or rather bodies that have been constructed as disabled by society. And in the case of Lorenza, what we see is a body fighting, really using performance, using painting, using photograph, using sometimes a sculpture to fight between different regimes of visibility in which her body is trapped as disabled. Whereas basically you will see Lorenza, I mean, there is nothing disabled about Lorenza. The only thing that is disabled is the regime of visibility in which she's inscribed. So on one side, this body is hyper visible as pathology. In, in the history of medicine and legal visual discourses, this, the body of both trans bodies and crypt bodies are hyper visible within this regime of uh, medical and legal discourses. They are also hyper visible as objects of the freak show, as therefore objects of a new erotic 
and uh, consumption in a way like capitalist consumption that becomes like a kind of comes comes to be overlapping with the the medical and legal regimes of visibility and i was i i wanted to um to make the difference and i see i'm sure that you have already seen this difference between two uh, portraits two images two photographs that you see in the series that i show in the powerpoint one was taken by Joel Peter Witkin in 1986, and is a representation of Lorenza Aspacus. And I, I'm sure that uh, Joel can, can find it and, and show it to you uh, more precisely. And the other one is Lorenza as Icarus, represented with uh, two wings, open wings, and this is a, an image by Robert Miller. I think that in both cases, of course, the, the uh, transcript body is given visibility, but it's still given visibility within this regime of the freak show and at almost like in, in this friction relationship with me medical and legal regimes that have excluded and disabled different bodies. I think that you can immediately see the difference between those representations and the representations that Lorenza is doing of herself. Um, it's extremely important how Lorenza is going to use both performance and photography and painting, mostly through portrait painting and through portrait uh, performance and photography. She's going to use those techniques, techniques as truly technologies of gender to fabricate a form of femininity that, of course, is not and cannot be the form of femininity that is dominating either in heteronormative discourses, but also within the queer community up to that point, because this is an, a, a femininity without arms. And you will see within, within her clips you will see one of the, the clips is from Lorenza performing in 1985 in the uh, Spanish theater in New York. And you will see how Lorenza is starting some of her performances by walking like in a fashion show with clothing that she's doing for herself. Because of course, one of the issues of representing the body, the crib body publicly, is how the body uh, is being clothed, is being how, what is the, the way in which the body can be presented in public. So what Lorenza is doing is really making her own uh, clothing, and many of the times she's performing, she's starting either before or after being naked, and the relationship of Lorenza to nakedness is astonishing, there is, no, uh, there is no conflict in the case of Lorenza between her apparently, and I, I stressed apparently, male sex and her female transgender persona. So you will listen to Lorenza within the, one of the clips that I'm showing in which she's speaking about uh, her doubts concerning the possibility of having uh, a full transsexual operation, and quote unquote, you know, like basically the idea um, that Lorenza is thinking in the uh, in the early 80s to act as the medical system to recognize her body as transsexual, and therefore asking for uh, a vaginoplasty. But of course, in in a regime that has fully codified Lorenza as creep. There is no possibility for her to be to define herself as transsexual. She is already a creep body, so there is no 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 second possibility for her of rehabilitating her femininity within this regime. And of course, also at a certain point, she will just like basically give up and say like, okay, I mean. But at the same time, what is interesting is that you will not see a denial of her physical body as a male body. On the contrary, uh, she's fully using her body as a female body in spite of what traditional anatomy will consider a male uh, sexual organ.
So you will see uh, this performance and um, together with this hypervisibility uh, of the body as pathology of the body as an object of the freak show, there are another layer which is really important in the case of, uh, of Lorenza, which is the body that becomes visible as the proof of technological progress, the proof of um, the success, success of scientific experimentation and the uh, this hyper positive discourse of the industries of disability. It is within this regime of visibility that Lorenza is going to become Petra. You see some of the images at the end of the PowerPoint. Petra is the uh, the mascot for the Paralympics of Barcelona in 1992. It's a, a, a puppet that is designed by the artist Mariscal. And what is going to happen with Lorenza is that her physical body will disappear fully uh, inside this carcass of Petra. And of course, this is one of, of the ways in which her body's subjectivity will become paradoxically invisible because he's supposed to be the mascot of the, the Paralympics and the, the Paralympics are supposed to basically like um, put at the center of the scene the, the, the disabled quote unquote body. Nevertheless, this full puppet in which basically Lorenza will be forced to, to live through the, the Paralympics will make her body invisible. What is astonishing in the case of Lorenza is that she's always breaking those regimes of representation. So she will, there is no way for her to remain inside of Petra and she will always pop out in, in different ways. Um, the, the, ultimate, the ultimate form of invisibility is also uh, the one in which basically, and this is a tension in the case of Lorenza, because the trans body is made hyper visible as a sexual subject for being trans. But at the same time, the disabled body is made completely invisible as a sexual subject. So the, the way this crisscross relationship makes uh, Lorenza extremely interesting because he's going to really play with this invisibility, visibility of uh, her, her sexuality and will fully display, display a, a body that is extremely sexual and eroticized, nevertheless, outside of the regime of freakness, of the regime of the, the pathological image of, of the medical discourse. So what, what you will see in the work of Lorenza in many ways are representations uh, or performances of scenes of subjection that have to do with these different regimes of visibility and you will see Lorenza constructing scenes of emancipation, scenes of becoming a political body in action, uh, fighting with those regimes of visibility. So this is my, my introduction to Lorenza uh, for you today. And I just want you to uh, have the chance. Maybe some of the clips are too long. If, feel free, please, if you want to cut a little bit. But you will see one of the clips in which he's performing in, in New York, which is extremely interesting because he's going to perform the scene of subjection, both of the uh, sick body, the trans sexual body and um, the, the disabled body and uh, reconstruct her whole body as a dancing free uh, transgender female body. And I think that this, this scene is, is of such a beauty that I hope that uh, the quality of the, the film will allow you to, to really see it well. And maybe what we can do is that I let you uh, see these clips let me just say one thing about the first one that you will see, which is basically like a more mainstream documentary that was done in the 80s in Germany, in which her mother has uh, a, key, uh, a key role. Uh, this is a complex relationship. I will not come back now today about it. But of course, the relationship of, um, in a way, subjection of non-able bodies to the regime of the family is extremely strong. So basically we find uh, in this film almost at equal level 
of agency and subjectivity, her mother talking about Lorenza and Lorenza talking about herself. And you will see that Lorenza is not as free as he's normally uh, in, in her performances because he's confronted with both the, her mother and this more normative uh, gaze of a mainstream documentary that will end up in uh, being shown on German TV in the uh, in the early 90s. So please uh, have a look to both uh, clips if you if you want to have the time, and I'll I'll come back to you uh, maybe in a, in a few minutes, and maybe we can you can ask some questions if you want, and if I'm able to to listen to you, I can. I can answer or just like get in a dialogue with you. Thank you so much. Den Tag, wo ich dich so sehe, den Tag bin ich nicht mehr deine Mutter. Die Kunst hat sich eigentlich so ergeben. Ja, ich habe mich immer mit Zeichnen beschäftigt und das hat sich ergeben mehr, als was ich es wollte. Ich wollte eigentlich immer Tänzer werden. Ich beobachte sehr viel, ich mag beobachten. Meine Bilder entstehen aus, was ich im Tag, irgendeine Begegnung, irgendwas gesehen habe, gerade meine Stimmung. Wenn ich zum Beispiel cremig bin, dann werde ich höchstwahrscheinlich mit dunklen Farben arbeiten und motivemäßig werde ich mehr einen Rücken zeigen. Oder wenn ich wütend bin, dann zeige ich gebalgte Körper oder aggressiven Farben. Ein guter Beispiel ist dieser Bodybuilding. Wir kannten uns nicht, wir haben uns begegnet. Es war eine sehr eine starke Kühle da und eine Unsicherheit. Und diese habe ich eben in diesem Bild rausgebracht. Ich meine, das ist ja ein Künstler, zu von seinem Standpunkt Dinge zu sehen. Dann habe ich eine Zeit lang wirklich fast ausschließlich nur mich porträtiert und gemalt. Und dann habe ich mich ohne Arme gemacht und möglichst dann nackt, um zu zeigen, dass man auch eine eigene Ästhetik hat. Ich habe eine ganze Serie über den Icarus, wo ich also mich selber mit Flügel gemalt habe. Vögel haben mir schon immer fasziniert, von der Leichtigkeit, von der Freiheit wegzufliegen, wo sie hin sie wollten. Und das war immer so, dass wenn ich zur Schule gegangen bin, dann bin ich so unter einen Hochspannungsmast vorbeigegangen und habe mich nach oben gesehen und dann habe ich die Federn runterkollern sehen und habe gesagt, da oben muss ein Nest mit, wie sagt man, Nestlinge sein und das gehst du irgendwann mal holen was passiert ist, was man mir erzählt hat, weil ich erinnere mich nicht mehr dran. Ich erinnere mich, dass ich bis vor den Pfosten gewesen bin und danach nichts mehr. Als ich den Vogelnest greifen wollte, der Vogelmutter rausgeflogen ist, rausgeflattert und durch diesen Flattern oder diesen spontanen Moment habe ich mich dann erschrocken und das Gleichgewicht verloren. 
Und um nicht runterzufallen, habe ich mich eben in den Kabeln, die so um mich waren, festgehalten. Und dann ist es eben passiert. Ich wachte im Krankenhaus auf, sechs Stunden später auf. Also ich war dann ohnmächtig. Nach drei Tagen, wo man versucht hat, also alle Mögliche zu retten, weil es, die Arme waren ja verkohlt bis zum Ellbogen und weiter, also starke Verbrennung weiter oben, äh, hat man mich nach Santiago de Chile gebracht. Und äh, da hat man mich operiert. Äh, da erstmal nur bis zum Ellbogen. Und dann drei Monate später musste das noch mal operiert werden und amputiert werden bis zum äh, Anfang der Schulter, weil äh, Brand reingekommen ist. Ich war neun. Neun Jahre. Auf irgendeine Art und Weise bin ich auch ein Exhibitionist und, und das finde ich gut. Also mir, mir kommt das echt zugute. Allerdings weiß ich nicht immer, ich muss echt sagen, dass das sich das durch meine Behinderung mehr oder weniger ergeben hat, weil es, ja, die Leute gucken so oder so, ob ich ganz gescheit gekleidet bin oder ganz verrückt. Aber ich habe Spaß daran. Ich habe Spaß daran, den Leuten die Augen zu öffnen, wie dumm es ist, sich hinter so bürgerliche Sachen zu verstecken und zurückzuziehen. performance piece because we're going to run out of time otherwise and we have to do a, a bit of a change around uh, after this uh, but we will if there's time we'll make the rest of the film available to you so we want to show the little clip that Paul recommended uh, of uh, Lorenza dancing uh, in New York <laughs>
Um, Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Actually. Okay. Yes. So um, we have uh, the video of the dance playing. We watched um, a little bit of the documentary, but in the interest of coming back to you and making sure that we had time for some questions. Um, okay. We, yeah. Okay. So I, I want. I think that the best thing to do at this point might be to open it up and see if people have questions. We. I might have a question about what we're watching in the performance video. There's a. Uh, a, a piece where two people come onto the stage and sort of almost kidnap and hold Lorenza and then redress her. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what we're actually seeing, and then we'll see if there are some questions. Yeah, I mean, this, this, uh, this is a classic performance. This uh, is in many different places, sometimes in institutions, uh, sometimes in theaters, but also in the public space, which you have to imagine what is the reaction of uh, basically the, the people that are just like walking on the streets and then suddenly you see Lorenzo sometimes painting with her feet, dancing, and then you see two people coming. These are two friends of Lorenzo uh, that have been working with her and really constructing what I was calling before this scene of subjection, this thing, uh, scene which basically her body will be constructed as a disabled body. Which, what Lorenza is going to show is that is the, uh, the, the medical and legal regime, the uh, sexual different regime, and, and I think it's very interesting to see the alliance between these two regimes, constructing what she will call the bourgeois body. The bourgeois body is not just a female and all male body. It's also a particular able body, but what is being constructed by the, uh, the medical institution and um, by the industries of the capacity is a body that we see at the beginning as fully able in reality, like dancing and having a very, a very uh, strong agency, political and artistic agency, we're going to see the transformation of this body into a disabled body, a body that is being dressed up with First with the uh, straight jacket, but then with a uh, male outfit, but also with the prosthesis as the repetition of the imitation of the able body that is forced within the crib body. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion of that will be the transformation of Lorenza into a male disabled subject, basically a subject that cannot even move anymore and that's completely locked. Uh, what is coming after that you have not seen maybe in the, in the clip because it's maybe too short is coming after is again the uh, unlocking of, of this uh, disabled body and the becoming again with uh, a dress and dancing the, the, the scene of emancipation of Lorraine. This is and this, this interesting is that this uh, relationship between the scene of subjection and the scene of emancipation is going to be played out in Lorenza's work many ways and in different ways uh, all along her work uh, in both public places and in theaters. Perfect. Okay, does anybody want to at this point jump in with a comment or a question? Well, I have to say that yeah. They were some of the, of the first people to see these clips, uh, you know, from, but right. there are very, very few people that have seen the work of Lorenza uh, this way. So uh, it's interesting for me as well to see how you react to it, what do you think, and how, you, how would you imagine, like, even, uh, you know, integrating uh, the work of Lorenza within your own in, in political imagination. Okay, I think we have one, one comment or question and for the presentation of Lorenza's work at Documenta. And um, I also really enjoyed the paper you wrote for the State League about Ocaña. And uh, I was wondering if you could uh, develop a bit more on Ocaña and why it's also this kind of hidden treasure within maybe Spain or Barcelona. And Yeah. Well, okay. Jack, yeah. could, you, you, could you repeat the question to me because I can't really hear. The, the question is about the, the other artist, Ocaña, the, yes. the, oh, yeah, the yes. Spanish artist. Because you, you wrote this paper for the State of the League. 
You, you wrote a paper for the Stedelijk about uh, Okana. Yes, yeah. And I mean, he wants you to elaborate on, on which... On why is this hidden figure that is maybe only known within maybe the Spanish or the Catalonian yeah. context even? Why, why is he not known? Why well, is he hidden? Well, he's really hidden. As, uh, and I think that what is interesting is not to, not to transform either Ocaña or Lorenza into extraordinary cases and unique cases. And then suddenly they become these kind of heroes. But to think how many Ocañas and how many Lorenzas exist already that we are unable to see because it's our own epistemological regime, our own regime of understanding both political agency and art that is preventing us from recognizing what is already there. In the case of, of Ocaña, uh, he was a working class migrant from the south coming to Barcelona, uh, extremely flamboyant, uh, developing a, a transgender female persona in public. And he, be he became really active as also a political activist at that time, in a, in a post-Franco time. What is interesting for me is that maybe because of this um, political upheaval of the early 80s in Spain after dictatorship, uh, it was the possibility of reconstructing the regime of visibility within the public sphere. And it's, it's in this reconstruction, in this moment of reconstruction, there are, and I think that this is interesting for all of us to think about, moments in which the public sphere and the, the regimes of visibility of the public sphere are fully frozen, and it seems that we cannot even invent anything else because we are in moments of uh, repetition and moments in which, because of a political transformation, there is a breakup within the regimes of visibility, and suddenly what was invisible before can appear as visible. And this is the moment in which Ocaña, but also uh, Lorenza, will appear and will become visible. Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. It actually follows Paul beautifully on the last presentation by Jean Vaccaro, where she was asking us to look away from the sort of major figures that represent trans possibility towards a minor archive, which you've just given us here today, and in terms of Karen Barad's work on the impossibility of certain forms of embodiment. And this last clip that you explained so well to us is, you know, a perfect example of a body that was perfectly able, that was creating its own choreography that has to become disabled for that regime of visibility and invisibility to operate. So, I, because we're, we're actually moving beautifully now onto uh, a, a completely otherworldly uh, choreography by Boy Child next. Um, I think this is, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, wish, so I wish you were here. Be there. I, I, I love uh, your work, Boy Child, so I, I will miss it. Uh, so, such a pity not to be there. Okay. But talking with you in my heart. We yes. miss you, uh, we all love you, and we hope to see you again. I love you all.